Hello, hello everybody. So it's my uh, pleasure uh, to introduce uh, uh, Dr. Yong Lee from MIT. He will uh, speak about uh, metric Strominger Yarosa's law conjecture. Thank you for giving hello, this talk. Um, it's my pleasure to speak at this Zoom seminar. So today I'm going to talk about the metric version of the SYZ conjecture. The name stands for Strominger Yao and Zas law. Um, so just for the benefit of everybody being on board, uh, let's try to first review a few basic concepts. So first of all, I expect everybody knows what Kähler manifold is. Uh, so there's an important class of Kähler manifolds called Canabial manifolds. Uh, so what this means is that you have a nowhere vanishing holomorphic volume form. Uh, so this would be an N0 form. Uh, and a metric is called Canabial. Um, well, if there's a special condition on the Kähler metric, um, and the best way to describe it is to say, uh, so you have the symplectic form, uh, which is otherwise called the Kähler form, and you can raise it to the nth power that would give you a volume form. Uh, and starting from your holomorphic volume form, uh, you can wedge that thing by its complex conjugate that also gives you a, a top dimensional form. Uh, and if you just require these two things to be proportional, that's the condition for it to be Kalabiyao. Uh, so the reason people are interested in this is because uh, Kalabiyao metrics, uh, so that, that kind of Kähler metrics is called Kalabiyao metrics. Uh, if you view that as a Riemannian metric, then it satisfies uh, the VC flatness condition, or in other words, the Einstein's equation with zero cosmological constant. Uh, so central objects are central objects of study in um, differential geometry and neighboring fields. Um, so the strominger yao law conjecture um, is, let's say, asks for the following. So you want to find a, a large enough class of clavial manifolds near a particular degenerate limit called large complex structure limit uh, so that a special Lagrangian torus vibration of half of the dimension exists in the generic region. So that's quite a lot of words. So, so let's try to unpack a little bit. Um, so there's this word called large complex structure limit. So if you're not familiar with that, so just remember kind of two things. Uh, so the big theorem about uh, Klabiao uh, metrics is the big theorem of Yao, which says that uh, if you give me a compact um, Calabial manifold in the sense of having this nowhere vanishing holomorphic volume form, that would be an entirely algebraic metric condition, uh, relatively easy to check in examples. Uh, and, and then you give me a Kähler class. Then there exists a, a unique representative of this Kähler class, which, which satisfies the Calabial condition uh, in, in a metric sense. Um, so therefore, to specify a Calabial metric, you essentially need two pieces of data. One is the complex structure, or up to a scale, essentially the holomorphic volume form. And the second piece of data is uh, the Kähler class. So uh, the large complex structure limit uh, refers to a situation in which essentially the Kähler class is fixed, uh, or in slightly more technical words, you have a polarization line bundle. Uh, but if you're more symplectic minded, you can just think the symplectic form kind of, in some sense, the symplectic structure in some sense is fixed, but a complex structure can vary. Uh, and a particular way of uh, varying the complex structure uh, and allowing it to go to certain quite severe limits is called large complex structure limit. So it's a, a way to degenerate the metric. So the metric becomes quite singular in this limit. And special Lagrangian, well, Lagrangian uh, is a concept in symplectic geometry. So it means, uh, so the complex dimension is N and you're looking for a real n-dimensional, in other words, half dimensional, half of the dimension of the total space, um, uh, some manifold. And this thing is called Lagrangian if the symplectic form restricts to zero on, on this submanifold. And it's called special Lagrangian um, if, well, so you, so you also have this piece of data called the holomorphic volume form. Uh, so that's a kind of N0 type form. If you restrict to that Lagrangian, um, well, basically it's, um, 
you, you, can, you can ask for the imaginary part of that thing to vanish. Uh, and that, that's the condition of being special. Um, so the reason people care about special Lagrangians uh, is because uh, there's a, a quite elementary argument which says as long as this condition is satisfied, then these sum manifolds are in particular minimal. Uh, and uh, well, in fact, they are absolute volume minimizers within their homology classes, uh, which is one of the reasons people want to study them. There are many other reasons from syntactic geometry and beyond. Uh, so the conjecture basically wants a special Lagrangian torus vibration. Uh, and the word generic region, well, that takes a little bit of interpretation. Uh, one possible interpretation you can think is just 99% of the Calabial manifold. Uh, so in what sense is it 99%? Well, you have a holomorphic volume form that induces a measure because you can wage the holomorphic volume form by the, um, this complex conjugate. And the Calabial condition is essentially saying this is kind of proportional to your volume form anyway. So the generic region would be kind of 99% of the uh, of the volume measure, let's say. For, for instance, that could be a possible uh, reasonable notion of generic. Um, so the original SYZ conjecture is motivated by physics um, and therefore is not actually 100% precise. So the strong version would actually assert as a typo uh, that the special Lagrangian vibration exists globally rather than just on 99% of the manifold. Of course, 99% is just a, a way of saying, you know, a very almost like 100%, but um, only becoming 100% in a limit somehow. Um, so that strong version would be much harder or possibly even false. And there are some objections uh, by Dominic Joyce. Uh, what he observed is that. Um, so usually when you think about a vibration, you, you should have singular fibers, typically. Um, but the naive expectation is that the vibration map itself is defined by a smooth map. And uh, the work of choice suggests that this is almost certainly false. Uh, so the strong version with some kind of extra hypothesis is almost doomed. Um, the strong version itself is not falsified, but many people start to doubt it as well. So, um, so this viewpoint on the SYZ conjecture is very much PD focused in the sense that it's very much about the Canabial metric and about special Lagrangians, which are kind of special examples of, you know, we see flat manifolds or Einstein manifolds uh, and, you know, minimal sum manifolds, et cetera, which, which is kind of PD heavy. Uh, so some people don't like it and they adopt much softer viewpoints uh, softer in the kind of soft versus hard uh, analysis distinction. So the softer viewpoints would be, you know, you either focus purely on the algebraic geometry or symplectic geometry or the topology. Uh, many people who do mirror symmetries kind of select one of, you know, the, the complex structure or the symplectic structure, but they don't simultaneously study the entire metric structure. So the large complex structure limit roughly means a uh, polarized. So polarized means you have uh, an ample line bundle uh, over uh, the manifold. Another way to say it is essentially you have a projective embedding to some large projective space. Um, so there are some technical conditions, um, but for the purpose of this talk, we don't have to go into the generality because we are going to pretty much focus on one particular example in which everything is very explicit. Uh, so as I said, the word generic in this context means 99% of the measure. So there's a, a particular favorite measure on the Calabria manifold. So there, there's a, a sort of special case of the SYZ conjecture where the uh, where the Calabial metric is actually hypercalar rather than just Calabial. Um, so th that is a very kind of special situation. And in that case, um, the special Lagrangian vibration, well, you up to kind of doing some hypercalar rotation stuff, you can transform that into uh, an elliptic vibration, or in other words, the fibers are sort of abelian varieties. 
so in that context, uh, we can transform the special Lagrangian vibration into a holomorphic vibration. Uh, and that situation is much better understood. Uh, so the topic of today is very much kind of orthogonal to this situation uh, in which we kind of we, we focus on one particular family, but, but that family will not have the hypercalar feature. Uh, and therefore, you, uh, you can't actually shortcut. So there is uh, another kind of typical of the iceberg somewhere uh, in the neighbor, neighboring field. Um, so this is mostly work due to Sebastian Buxon and his collaborators uh, about the non-comedian geometric aspect of uh, the SYZ conjecture. So I guess we probably don't have enough time to go into that for, for today. So the main hero of today is this explicit family, which I call the Fermat family, uh, perhaps for quite obvious reasons. Um, so it's a family of hypersurfaces in the projective space. So it, it, it has a very explicit defining equation. Uh, just look at this. So the ZIs are the homogeneous coordinates on the projective space. So we have a single equation. So this in particular is a hypersurface. The equation depends on the parameter uh, S, which uh, in the limit becomes a very large. So this is a particular way of degenerating the hypersurface into some singular limit. So for generic S, this would be smooth, but in the limit, it will become quite singular. So the reason I call it the Fermat family is because of this term, which uh, I think everybody would immediately kind of think about the Fermat conjecture. So uh, somehow that's the, the reason for the name. Um, but it's not just this term, but also this term. And in fact, when S goes to infinity, then if you just purely take the algebra geometric sense of the limit, then this term would go away. And in the limit, you would have the union of you know, all the z i equal to zero, which is uh, essentially uh, a collection of n plus two uh, linear projective spaces. So that would be just a purely algebra geometric perspective. The metric perspective uh, looks quite different from what this discussion suggests. Um, so there is a, a favorite polarization, which is kind of like you, so because everything is embedded in the projective space, so you can take the standard class on the projective space and use that to define a Kähler class. So you can pull back to the hypersurface that gives you a, a polarization, or in other words, a, K, a choice of the, the Kähler, um, uh, well, the Kähler class. And uh, one thing you can do is you can, uh, put a scaling factor in front of this class. So the reason we like this scaling is because it ultimately gives rise to uh, a finite diameter, so non-trivial uh, Gromov of Hausdorff limit in a metric sense. So if you use a different scaling convention, uh, you, well, you, you might get some other kinds of limits, but from the metric perspective, uh, perhaps you like a finite diameter limit. So the theorem um, for this particular family is that the weak version of the SYZ conjecture holds for this particular family, at least up to subsequence uh, as S goes to infinity. So the weak version means 99% of the manifold, not 100% of the manifold. Uh, so that this difference is quite crucial for technical purposes because uh, on that 100% of the manifold, the, the manifold itself becomes very singular. So on that 99%, the manifold is not very singular and finding this uh, special Lagrangian vibration is much easier in uh, context. But, but still you have to do something quite non-trivial about the clamp geometric in order to get this. So um, there, there's also a more general version of the theorem, but it's not going to be the topic of today because uh, it requires more background on non comedian geometry stuff. So we most kind of, mo mostly we will just focus on this, which is very explicit. So the reason we like this particular family 
um, is because it has quite a lot of symmetry. So there's no continuous symmetry, but there is plenty of discrete symmetry. So in particular, you can permute any of these coordinates and the permutation group gives you a, a large collection of symmetries uh, or discrete symmetries. So you can use this permutation symmetry to simplify the combinatorics at some stage. Um, so that, that goes into the more technical part of the proof. So we hope that the result uh, itself can be generalized to many other families, although this kind of simplification is quite special to this family. Uh, we also think that this limit should be unique uh, and passing to the subsequence should not be necessary. Um, uh, in fact, if you use a different approach using non-comedian geometry, that would follow as a, as a consequence. But the non-comedian geometry approach itself depends on some additional conjecture. So at the moment, the uh, SYZ conjecture is only kind of proved uh, without further assumptions in, in, in this case. So um, I should probably talk about some easy aspects of the complex geometry. So the metric itself is quite complicated, but uh, understanding just the complex structure is not super hard because the manifold itself is given very explicitly uh, and you, understanding the complex structure essentially just amounts to uh, constructing good charts, uh, which is uh, more or less an easy exercise. Uh, but the main conclusion of uh, you know, analyzing the charts is that the complex structure uh, in most of uh, the regions inside the Calabria manifold in, in the, this Fermat family, uh, so when this S is very large, uh, the generic region is actually modeled on a large annulus region in C star to the N. Uh, so this just means well, I mean, something explicit like this, um, or geometrically, you can think of that as a kind of very long cylinder. So metrically, it will be slightly more complicated than this, but complex geometrically, it's very simple. So how do you see that this feature is satisfied by the Fermat family? Well, there's a slightly more general viewpoint. So you can consider the smooth hypersurfaces uh, of this form. So this is a pretty general shape of a smooth hypersurface, depending on some extra uh, scaling parameters uh, inside some toric varieties. Uh, and when you, uh, when you take this, so you, you want to understand what happens when the parameter goes to very large. Uh, so in the generic region, uh, so when you take the parameter to be very large, then what happens is that in the generic region, only two terms. So in general, you have uh, many monomial terms, but in the generic region, only two terms will dominate all the rest. Uh, and when this happens, then the local structure of the hypersurface is modeled on C star to the N, because it's basically equating, you know, two monomial terms, and that gives you one monomial equation and one monomial equation uh, inside uh, the big toric chart of the toric variety uh, that, uh, well, that essentially imp that imposes one equation on C star to the n plus one, and, and what you get is locally kind of C star to the n, uh, with natural local coordinates being given by the logarithms. Uh, so the reason you don't get the entire C star to the n is because you are just analyzing local charts. So the local charts uh, is satisfied when this condition is satisfied, uh, but not globally. Uh, so really the kind of geometry is kind of stratified uh, in the sense that you know, just having two monomial terms dominating all the rest is the most generic behavior. And the next level of genericity would be three uh, terms dominating the rest and uh, etc. So uh, the more you kind of equate them, the more terms appearing in the expression, um, the less generic it is. So for the purpose of the weak version of the SYZ conjecture, essentially you just need to focus on the most generic part, in which case the complex geometry simplifies quite drastically. So if you really try to analyze how the local charts uh, fit together, 
then you will uh, get into some tropical geometry uh, kind of uh, combinatorial patterns. Um, and the Fermat family itself is quite manageable in this case. Uh, but in general, you would get quite complicated combinatorics coming out of this. Essentially, you just try to analyze the charts and, and you, you will face some combinatorial pattern. So now let's move on to the more metric discussions. So Calabria metrics, uh, which is just uh, what I described, the uh, k the form uh, raised to the nth power is equal to uh, this holomorphic volume form, uh, which buys complex conjugates up to a constant. That's the condition for Calabria metrics. So this has an important dimensional reduction. Uh, so you just impose torus symmetry and uh, something will come out. So what you do, well, you take uh, a function on C star to the n, uh, actually just some open subset, and require this function to be invariant under the torus uh, acting on C star to the n. So you can think of C star to the n uh, topologically as uh, a n-dimensional torus times Rn, uh, and we are requiring the function to be constant on the torus fibers. In other words, the function itself is pulled back from a, a, a function on this base Rn. Um, so you get a function of Rn, and you can translate the condition for the uh, potential of the Kähler potential to satisfy the Calabria equation into a condition about the function downstairs. And the conclusion is that um, the function upstairs is the Kähler potential, or for experts, people like to say plurisaponic. So that happens if and only if the function downstairs is complex. And the function upstairs uh, satisfies the complex motion pay equation. Uh, in other words, it's Calabial, uh, if and only if the function downstairs satisfies the real motion pay equation. So more explicitly, that means the determinant of the Hessian of U is equal to a constant. So metrics coming from this dimensional reduction are called semi-flat because the restriction to the torus fibers are flat. Uh, and the reason these are flat is because you impose the torus symmetry. So the metric on the torus fibers, um, if, so if you know that that metric is torus symmetric, it, it would have to be some Euclidean metric. So in particular, they are flat, uh, but the metric is not quite a product metric. So the the metrics on the fibers can vary from fiber to fiber. So really the key point of um, what we're going to assert about the metric is that the metric has a, a smooth asymptote uh, in the C infinity topology of the following shape. So omega s is the Kähler metric on uh, the Fermat hypersurface in some uh, Kind of C star to the n chart as we described. And uh, so these are the kind of logarithmic coordinates on the C star to the n charts. So, so we are trying to say that, okay, we want to prove that the Kähler matrix is, uh, is approximately equal to a semi-flat matrix when S is sufficiently large. Um, more explicitly in this coordinate, it will take this form. So we have taken a particular scaling convention on the Kähler class, which is compatible with finite diameter from of household limit as S goes to infinity. So once you have a, a metric asymptotic of this shape, then the special Lagrangian vibration in the generic region is more or less for free. Um, and it's because this would just be a small deformation of the logarithm map. Uh, so the logarithm map being the map from C star to the n to Rn, uh, which just takes the logarithm uh, coordinate wise. So that's, uh, that's a, a relatively easy thing. And if you just look at the semi-flat metric, which is kind of the right-hand side part of this equation, then if you just take the fibers of the logarithm map, these would be automatically special Lagrangians. 
But so those five, this, it will give you a special Lagrangian vibration with this as the model metric. Um, so suppose you know that the true metric is not quite exactly this, uh, but the error is sufficiently small, then you can do a relatively easy perturbation analysis to say that uh, this initial special Lagrangian vibration can be perturbed into a special Lagrangian vibration for this new metric. So that perturbation step is not particularly hard um, and it just uses quite standard deformation theory. Um, it will become hard if you also consider this, the kind of singular regions, but since we are only working on a generic region, we don't have to face essential difficulties in this step. So the main difficulty is to prove this thing about the metric. So the proof is essentially about potential estimates and um, metric asymptotes uh, uniformly in S. Um, so um, there is uh, essentially two parts. One is um, you need to work, uh, you, you need to make certain convergence assumptions, uh, convergence assertions about Kähler potentials. So you need, uh, instead of C infinity convergence of this, you need to first show that uh, the Kähler potential of this Kähler metric converges to uh, essentially the Kähler potential coming from this function u, um, at least in the C0 sense. So proving the C0 sense um, convergence of the potential, uh, that step uses um, something called the complex pluri well, complex pluri potential theory. Um, so, uh, in other words, the study of Kähler potentials in general uh, using complex analytic methods. So, this is one of the technical cores of uh, this whole proof. And another part of the proof is once you have the C0 convergence of the potential, how can you get it into, how can you improve this into some C infinity convergence? So, there's a quite big difference between C0 and C infinity. Uh, so that part uses more uh, techniques from elliptic PDEs, but more specifically, there is a result of Ovidio Sabin, which uh, we used uh, at this step. Uh, so the, the result of Sabin itself is uh, quite non-trivial, uh, but uh, our application of that is, is reasonably straightforward. Uh, so. Really, the most difficult part uh, for us is proving the C0 convergence of the Kähler potential. And the sort of intuition about um, the convergence of Kähler potentials, etc., is that near the um, S going to infinity limit, or in other words, large complex structure limit in this particular case, uh, there's a very strong tendency for any Kähler potential uh, on this. Uh, Hyper, FEMA hypersurface to be approximated by convex potentials. So uh, we just talked about this dimensional reduction to the uh, semi-flat metric case. So you can just think about the same thing just purely at the level of potentials. Uh, so what this is saying is that um, pretty much that dimensional reduction is forced on. So that could be quite surprising to to you uh, when, when you first think about it. And in fact, that's one of the main surprises to me. Um, so this uh, can be expressed more technically in terms of a Skoda type estimate. Um, so we might not have time to go too much into that, but with some additional little control on the volume density, um, this kind of approximation can be improved to a C0 type uh, convergence estimate uh, in the generic region. And the underlying package is called plural, complex plural potential theory. So the intuition of, uh, of this is, well, you, uh, you start from a general uh, pluris harmonic function, or in other words, a Kähler potential, uh, locally defined on something like C star to the N. And you want to say, um, so what you ultimately want is that this thing is approximately given by the pullback of something on Rn. So in other words, it's approximately constant on the torus fibers. 
So this might sound uh, a little bit counterintuitive, um, but maybe the first thing you should do is you start from this scalar of potential. So how can you get a complex function downstairs to, to compare it with? Well, this step is not super hard. You start from this potential on C star to the N, really some annulus region. Uh, so what you can do is that you can take the average over uh, the torus fibers. Or uh, if you think in a different way, you can think about, um, so this C star to N being TN times RN, and you can kind of fully expand in the uh, in a TN direction, and you can expect the zeros fully mode. Uh, and what that will give you is just a function purely on I. Um, and that function must actually be convex. So, so this is a consequence of this being an average of PSH functions. Um, so intuitively, saying that the function is uh, almost the pullback of a function downstairs is asserting that all the higher Fourier modes, all, all the down zero Fourier modes are essentially very small. Um, and this, uh, you should think, is, is a kind of a feature of a PSH function. Uh, so a PSH function in general cannot be highly oscillatory. So that's the kind of intuition behind this. Um, and this is just a local construction. Um, it only works on uh, the chart in which you can pretend, uh, pretend everything lives on C star to the N. That is not true globally. It, it, it's true on the sort of generic region, uh, or really the charts in the generic region, but you need to also patch together this local construction uh, to produce a global Kähler potential, which kind of in, on local pieces sort of agree with this construction, at least in a C0 close sense. So in this way, you can construct a new Kähler potential uh, which more or less is kind of agreeing with uh, the convex functions um, in the generic region. And this new Kähler potential lives on the same uh, complex hypersurface, the, the, uh, the Fermat of the Fermat family. So the way you should think about this new Kähler potential is that it's morally speaking the regularization of the original Kähler potential of the Calabria metric. The reason why you should think about this as a regularization uh, is that this new Kähler potential um, is very close to a convex function. Uh, and a convex function has more a priori control than uh, a general Kähler potential. So a general Kähler potential, for, for instance, you can't quite control it in C1 norm. Uh, but a convex function, for a convex function, a C1 norm is, is pretty much automatic. So having so if you can show that the new Kähler potential is actually C0 close to the original potential, then that means, um, well, that, that sort of improves the regularity of the Kähler potential. So at this stage, you need some combinatorial discussion to, to patch together the local constructions. Uh, and this is the kind of combinatorial step which, uh, in which we actually use the specifics of the Fermat, K, of the Fermat family. Uh, so the pluripotential theory package uh, allows you to basically compare the Kähler potentials with some very weak assumptions about, um, well, let's say some kind of integral uh, control on these potentials and, and also some control on the volume density. So once you have that, you can show that uh, the new potential and the original Calabi-Yau potential uh, are essentially close together in some C0 sense. Um, so in order to carry out this package, you need to show that this package also works when the complex structure itself is highly degenerate. So you need to do a little bit of work in, in this direction. So the effect is that now the, uh, the Calabi-Yau potential is pretty much the same as the regularization, which is pretty much a convex function. Um, and the deviation between these two things uh, is small in C0 sense, at least in the good regions. So let's try to skip the more technical paths. 
So, uh, so now we know that the function, uh, the gate potential uh, is very close to the zero's Fourier mode, uh, which is a kind of a convex function. And for convex functions, you automatically get uh, Lipschitz spans. And therefore, uh, you have some compactness to get a subsequential limit. So you extract the subsequential limits of the sequence of Kähler potentials uh, by passing s to infinity. So s is the parameter of the Fermat hypersurface. So these two would have the same limit because their C0 norms differ by a, a small, very small amount. Um, so there are some caveats, but let's not worry too much about that. So then what you argue is that this limit itself solves the real Monchamp equation. Uh, so this should not be too surprising. So basically we're assuming that, uh, also we have pretty much argued or that is claimed that the uh, Kähler potential is close to uh, a convex function in the C0 sense. And uh, a sort of uh, well-known resulting kind of complex Fourier potential theory is that uh, the Monchamp measures are well behaved under C0 convergence of potentials. So you should expect the Monchamp type equation to pass through limits. So that's why this limit also should have a real Monchamp uh, equation. And um, right. so knowing that a limit satisfies the real Monchamp equation uh, would give you a lot of regularity control on the limit. So there is a package about the regularity theory of real Monchamp equations. Uh, this is the equation saying the determinant of Hessian of uh, some function, uh, some convex function is equal to a constant. So if, if something satisfies that equation, the real Monchamp equation, then uh, it's actually highly regular. Uh, it's known that such things are C infinity um, away from some uh, close subset of n minus one Hausdorff measure zero. So if you just want to consider the generic region, you can basically delete uh, subsets where, uh, where with small Hausdorff dimension, uh, sorry, yeah, so of, of at least Hausdorff uh, co-dimension one, which is kind of heavy measure zero. So if you delete such bad subsets, then you can essentially say that this limit is infinity. So if you don't want to worry about details, you basically pretend your limit is actually smooth. So now there is this question about, suppose you give me everything you want to know about the potential, so uh, which is basically the, the kind of C0 convergence uh, into a solution of the real Monchamp equation, then how are you going to improve that to an actual metric asymptote? So the metric asymptote requires much more regularity compared to uh, a pure statement about potentials. So the C0 convergence of potentials uh, is a, a very coarse statement. The C infinity convergence at the level of the metric is a much more refined statement. So you need some step to sort of bootstrap. So at this stage, there is a, a very non-trivial theorem of Sabin, which comes to the rescue. So this theorem is sometimes called the small perturbation theorem, but the result itself is actually highly non-perturbative. Uh, the proof is highly non-perturbative. The result, it turns out to, well, and we'll just, let, let, let's go over this. So it says, for a large class of fully nonlinear second order elliptic equations, uh, in particular, including the complex Monchamp equation of interest to this talk. So, if you know, uh, if you are given a smooth solution in some standard ball, and you have a second solution of the same equation, which is close to the original uh, solution, the smooth solution in the C0 sense then the second solution inherits the smooth bounds from the first solution. And these two things are actually C infinity close together. So it's called a small perturbation theorem 
because it basically says that if two things uh, solving the same equation, uh, so one of them having a uh, well-behaved regularity a priori, the other you don't know anything, um, if these two are actually C0 close, then, uh, then actually the other is a perturbation of the first one. So the result says that the second solution is a perturbation of the first one. The, the proof itself is highly non-perceptive. So for, uh, from the purpose of um, our work, what we need is, okay, so, so we need to see how this is related to what we have just talked about. So in our case, we have essentially two functions. One is the Kähler potential of the club geometric you started with, which is this unknown thing, uh, B, uh, in this context. And the other is the solution of the real motion equation, which comes from the limit you are extracting. So, um, so by extracting the limit of uh, the Kähler potentials, you get some function which you know satisfies the real Monchamp equation, which you can also regard as a solution of the complex Monchamp equation by the dimensional reduction for the semi flat metric we just discussed. So we do know that such things are C0 uh, close together. This is the main output of the pluripotential theory part. Um, so this U satisfies the real Monchamp equation. And by what we just said about the regularity theory of the real motion equation, um, so this regularity theory essentially allows you to pretend as if U is smooth up to deleting some bad subset. So after deleting the bad subset, U is a, a perfectly smooth solution. And so we are in good shape of, of applying this theorem. And then the Output is to say that the unknown solution, which is the actual Calabian potential you want to understand, is actually C infinity close to uh, this real motion potential. So, in other words, uh, the Kähler potential of the actual Calabian metric is C infinity close um, to um, some potential which comes from a dimensional reduction, which is. Um, if you translate that into a metric statement, that is precisely uh, the thing we wanted to claim, which is, let me find it, um, which is this. So this is saying that you have a Calabian metric, um, which is the thing you want to understand. And the right-hand side is uh, some semi-flat metric, which comes from a dimensional reduction. So what Sabine's results eventually implies is that at the level of the potentials, um, these two things are kind of C infinity close together. So if you just differentiate, um, you get that at the metric level, these two things are also C infinity close together. And having that uh, metric asymptote, you uh, get the special Lagrangian vibration uh, by some further relatively easy perturbation argument. So really the difficult part is one, to have the, this, uh, this reworking of the complex pluripotential theory in a very degenerate setting. Uh, second, uh, to construct the, the kind of uh, regularization of the Kähler potential um, and using the kind of combinatorics of the particular setting of the FEMA hypersurface um, and try to prove that these two things are C0 close together. And finally, there is this quite, well, I, I, okay, the, the, there are two inputs from kind of elliptic PDE uh, theory. One is the regularity theory of the real Monchamp equation. The other is uh, this highly non-trivial theorem of Sabin. So that's pretty much the, the main strategy of the proof. I think it's probably a good time to stop. Um, so thanks for listening. I heard this is 45 minutes, right? Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the talk. Um, I imagine there are some questions in the audience. 
uh, I, maybe I can start by one. Can you can you give some uh, some uh, uh, details about the growing uh, procedure? Uh, how does it work in, in, in practice? A little bit this growing procedure, this tropical uh, combinatorics. Uh, sorry, you, you want the combinatorics part, or, or you want the commercial part? The, the, when you said you have the brewing before, I mean, uh, on the slide. Yeah, so, so there's this thing about patching together the yes. functions. Uh, this is quite technical. Um, so the, right. Um, so what you have is the convex functions on uh, produced from the kind of local charts. So, so one thing you need to know is how the local charts fit together. So that involves analyzing the tropical kind of uh, degenerations of the manifold. So, so, so it, it, it's, a, it's a kind of simplicial kind of analysis. Uh, so the detail of that is perhaps not so interesting, but maybe there are, there are some interesting ideas which goes into that, uh, which is um, so one way you can think about a Kähler potential is as follows. Uh, so you can always extend Kähler potentials to uh, a Kähler potential. So suppose your, your manifold is embedded in some projective space. You can always extend the Kähler potential into the Kähler potential on the ambient projective space. So that, that's an extension zero. So now if you want to produce um, a global version of a convex function, one thing you can start from is if, if you are able to produce a global um, toric metric on some uh, ambient projective space. So, so remember, we, we are talking about hypersurfaces. So hypersurfaces are embedded in ambient projective spaces. Uh, so the ambient projective space, you, on, on this, you can talk about the toric metrics, meaning um, things which have uh, Torus symmetry. Um, so such metrics would be equivalent to essentially convex functions on Rm plus one uh, with certain asymptotic behavior at infinity. Uh, so, uh, so this kind of rec uh, this patching step essentially amounts to saying that you have a collection of local convex functions uh, on kind of individual tropical pieces of certain tropical hypersurfaces. And you need to find a global convex function on, on R m plus one, uh, which kind of sort of like extend that uh, up to C zero small error. And the uh, and doing that is quite technical. Uh, but one other idea which goes into this is to take basically the Legendre transform of uh, so so it's it's it uses a kind of double Legendre transform type construction. Um, the, the details are probably too hard, uh, too, too uh, complicated to explain. Thank you, but already you gave some important information. Frederic has another question, please, Frederic. Yeah, uh, somehow related to the question of Julien. So uh, you, you focus on this example of uh, uh, Fermat uh, uh, hypersurface. Uh, but um, it, to extend to other situation, you were say, saying that the, the, this argument of patching and using tropical geometry is easier for the, the, the case you're, you're studying. So is it the main obstacle to extend to other situation, the, this patching aspect or uh, yeah, also? So, well, I mean, there, there, are, there are lots of related questions. Um, so, so one, one way to formulate the question, which, which is perhaps the most down to earth one uh, is, well, okay. So when, when you consider this kind of degeneration in general, the limit would be something quite tropical. Uh, so in other words, the, the natural limit from, uh, from a certain sense is actually a, something like a simplicial complex. So what is not clear to me in general is how you can define a limiting notion of Kähler potentials. So you see, we, we have a well-defined notion of Kähler potential on complex manifolds. Um, but as you do this degeneration, um, the, the limit is a, some kind of a simplicial complex coming from tropical hypersurfaces, et cetera. Uh, you, you might be able to vaguely imagine what that is. 
Uh, so I don't exactly know what would be a good notion of arcade potential on, on, on this kind of limiting object. Uh, so basically, the the patching step uh, in, in this construction sort of tries to answer that question in a very ad hoc way uh, by, by just sort of answering this question just purely on on a uh, let's say the boundary of a tetrahedron. Really. So, so suppose the relevant simplicial complex is actually the boundary of a tetrahedron, which, which is actually what's going on in the uh, Fermat case then this has an ad hoc answer, uh, which is quite down to us, but, but quite combinatorial. Uh, so in general, there, there is, so I'm not aware of a very down to us answer, but, but there is a different answer, which is not down to us. Uh, and that thing is called non median geometry. Um, so from the non median perspective, the limit, instead of being just some kind of simplicial complex, which you can sort of understand quite well. Uh, the limit is called a Birkovich space. Um, and the limiting notion of Kähler potentials are called, uh, well, non median pluris harmonic functions of non median semi positive metrics. So, I mean, the canonical reference for that would be the works of uh, Sebastian Buchsohn and his collaborators. Um, so, the uh, so I actually have some subsequent work in that direction, which basically says, assuming certain things about this non uh, well, so certain certain conjectures in that non median geometry, um, then you actually can prove the SYZ conjecture in quite large generality. Uh, so the problem is that certain things remain um, conjectural about this non median approach, and the reason is because we still don't understand what actually is uh, the limiting notion of, you know. So in the non median world, there is a very formal definition of, of, of this limiting notion, but that limiting notion is very difficult to check in practice. And if only you have a much more concrete understanding of that, 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 that would resolve that conjecture, I, I would think. I, I don't know if that's a good answer to your question. Oh, thank you, thank you. Uh, I'm sorry, also uh, another question, but you expect a different behavior in the case of uh, projective Calabiaos and non-projective Calabiaos? Um, so, so, uh, okay, so, so these works are all focused on the projective case. I guess the projective case is pretty much everything, right? I mean, uh, up to this uh, Ogmolov theorem, I mean, if you're not, I mean, it's either projective I mean, you, most of the Calabias are actually straight Calabias, right? I mean, otherwise you would have these torus directions. So I, I don't see that as a major problem. Okay. In, in any case, the non-projective Calabias are quite limited. Are there other questions from the audience, from the CRM? So no questions from us, but uh, thanks for the talk. Okay, so let's thank the speaker for his very interesting talk.